Good morning, my good friends. Talk about uh, apropos. So I want to talk about Dunning-Kruger and what it can teach us. And it's pretty cool because we have some of the most extreme examples of elitist authorities uh, right now criticizing someone who is just a self-taught. I've talked about this before. So we're going to talk about this because even Google fails to explain what Dunning-Kruger really is. So Dunning-Kruger was this um, study done a while back, and uh, they supposedly have debunked it. But no, Dunning-Kruger has actually taken on, taken on its own meaning. So forget the study itself, because no one really understood the study. One small part of it is the idea that when you first begin to learn about a subject, you think you know everything because you haven't yet learned how much there is to know. But as we witness, um, Eric Weinstein and Terrence Howard, um, just as example, Eric Weinstein kept making fun of Terrence Howard because I don't think you understand what supersymmetry means. And yet, I'm guessing the audience doesn't understand that that is denaturing Eric Weinstein's position because there may be a specific term uh, for that they use supersymmetry for, but those two words have meaning on their own and he can reuse it if he's willing to explain what he means by that. This is something we've done for thousands of years, repurposing a term. This is nothing new. So the fact that once again, this elitist is taking this stance shows that he's dying on a hill that is crumbling, right? And to give you another example, uh, another sad, sad elitist uh, by the name of Sabine Hassenfelder. Uh, she's right sometimes, but most of the time she is abhorrently wrong, malevolently wrong even. And so she attacks, of course, uh, Terrence Howard, without mentioning his name, obviously, uh, pretty cowardly, instead of realizing that this is how science moves forward. We have to take people and treat them like human beings, not the way these scientists are treating uh, Terrence Howard. All it's doing is showing what a bunch of elitist jerks these people are, right? Because even Eric Weinstein was humbled multiple times in that interview, and I only watched portions of it. And yet other times he was showing his own hubris, if not his own ignorance, stupio in uh, Latin, stupid, willful ignorance. But the greatest example of these is Neil deGrasse Tyson. In fact, Eric Weinstein, I can't believe this, used him as a call to authority, but at the same time tore him down a little bit. But let's understand this. Uh, let's go back a bit. Do you remember when um, Graham Hancock came on uh, the Joe Rogan experience uh, to be debunked by an archaeologist? But do you know that this particular archaeologist that was supposedly debunking Graham Hancock, this particular archaeologist only knows about garbage dumps, ancient garbage dumps. Right, So if he's going to debunk Graham Hancock, he really should have stayed in his area of uh, his little tiny little niche of expertise. Right, This is why autodidacts and polymaths are important. Right, As I said, Nietzsche said the greatest risk or one of the greatest risks is over-specialization. You have these giant ears to hear but no mouth to speak and no eyes to see or vice versa. You have a giant mouth to speak telling you, telling everyone what an expert you are, but you have no eyes to see the truth or ears to hear your errors. As I said, Carl Jung said, if what I held to be error guides me better than what I held to be true, I'll be guided by the error. Right? Neil deGrasse Tyson is a great example of the real lesson of Dunning-Kruger. It's not the noobs, these new people learning. That's not the problem. That's a tiny lesson that people just need to understand that there's always more to know. This is what Confucius said. The difference between knowledge and wisdom, wisdom is knowing how much there is to know and how little of it you have mastered as of yet. So that's the real lesson here. And in fact, Bruce Lee talked about this. Always have a mind knowing that there may be someone greater than thee.
right? That's the lesson of a true expert. When I talk about, say, something like a, an obscure topic like Yoga Kara or Chattiscoti, I don't go around thinking that I'm the expert on this. I just happen to be one of the few people that spend a lot of time thinking about it and, and talking about it and writing about it. But the real lesson here is I'm asking, I'm making bold statements in an attempt to further our understanding of these topics, not shooting down others by saying, well, that's the way it's always been. Because even Eric Weinstein failed completely when he talked about, well, you're not going to get anywhere because you don't have an EDU email and uh, the peer review and all this other stuff. When in reality, the greatest um, advancement in science, modern science, came from just a letter, just a paper written by Einstein in 1935. And of course, Niels Bohr responded just as a letter to the editor, arguing that they were wrong. But again, just like in the book of Job, when he said there will be a goali, there will be someone to justify me. Someone will um, be my redeemer. And guess what? Einstein, it took many decades, but we realized he was right. He was right. Why does it take so long, as, as Carl Jung said, these advancements in science can take 20 years to trickle their way down to the broader public. And I've said this before in podcasts. I think Jung didn't predict that it would be more like 40 or 50 years before this would trickle down because of so many of these scientists. I just said this in a podcast and I'm not going to probably publish because it was closer to a rant. I talked about how a doctor today doesn't really have very much education in the area of nutrition, in the area of reading uh, research and, and publications. That alone is really sad because doctors will go around telling you what, what uh, is true when, in fact, that's not science. Science is a, a struggle to understand. Wissenschaft. It's not what is true. It's a struggle to understand. Right? So there is no truth in the sense because it constantly evolves. Right, So the truth is an agreement, as William James and uh, Charles Sanders Peirce agreed on. But the lesson of Dunning-Kruger is actually what we're witnessing today. In fact, uh, there was a gentleman, I think his, his show used to be called Impact Theory, Tom Billieu, and uh, he may have earned a resubscribe because he was getting really weird there for a while. So, I mean, whatever. The, the unnotification, YouTube seems to unsubscribe, but I turn notifications on and off, on and off for some of these uh, YouTube channels. I've had my YouTube for almost 10 years now. So I have a lot of thousands of subscriptions. So I want the main ones to show up. But here I'm talking about Dunning-Kruger. The, 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 the lesson here is, and I've talked about this before, if you put three people on a stage, the foremost expert in the field, uh, the foremost student in this field, and a total BSer, who's going to win over the audience? Well, sadly, it's the total BSer. And this is where we're at today. Instead of these elites being calm and, and explaining their, their positions rationally. And no, it's all a call to authority, right? Listen to me. I'm the one with the PhD in astrophysics. But if you look at uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's one of the dumbest smart people on the planet. They forget that you got your PhD in a tiny, tiny little area of science Yet you go around acting as if you are the arbiter of truth, of science, of reality, of all of this. That's the real lesson of the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's not the noobs. The elites want to push this on us, right? Same as these people who think, well, if you don't have the, the accreditations behind your name or this or that, it's like, really? Go and take a look at some of the greatest advancements in science and philosophy and anything they weren't done by these uh, uh, associate professors, right? It was done by autodidacts, self-taught. It was done by polymaths, uh, people who specialized in multi -area, mul multiple areas. Just look at uh, Harold Bloom's book on genius. There's 100 geniuses in there. 
very few of them ended up producing something in the field they were uh, educated in. Very few. Right? I mean, Charles Taylor is a great example. He's a Canadian. He got his, uh, his initial degree at McGill here in Canada. And then he was a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford. And he got a couple of degrees over there, not just a PhD, but a postdoc, not just a master's, but a postdoc. But he didn't write about one thing, right? I mean, even when you look up in Google, I found it funny. It's like, what kind of philosopher is he? And all they could say was, I guess, hermeneutics, kind of, right? So the study for truth. But he talks about the self. He talks about faith, meaning, religion, identity, um, politics. I mean, the list is long, right? But he doesn't go around saying he's the expert on this stuff. In fact, what he does do is give supports for his own theories, right? He, he agrees with me on this idea of identity. In fact, he even agrees with W.E.B. Du Bois, this idea of a double consciousness if people don't recognize your, your humanity. But he wasn't saying that you're harmed if people don't recognize your fantasy, Right? So we have to understand this difference. I really like how Matthias Desmond's um, differentiated between who we are and, and, and who we pretend to be, right? Carl Jung's personas. Uh, he said that identity are the stories that other people tell that you live, right? Whereas your myth, your myth are the stories that you tell and you live, right? It's Nietzsche, this idea that identity, many of them, go together to make up who and what we are. And that can't be done in isolation. This is why you have to be true and authentic. Um, because, as I said, uh, Charles Taylor went on a long... Well, he explains it in the same way that Nietzsche did. This idea that we're one of the few, the most gregarious of animals, meaning we only know who... And what we are within the complex of, of, of I and thou, within the complex of society, you know, interaction, all that jazz. And that's how science, that's how understanding, that's how truth, hermeneutics is, is put forward. Not by these elitist jerks who just go around trying to tell people, that's not how science works. Well, I'm sorry. Like doctors, these scientists when they graduate from school and they do their PhD, they're already 20 years behind because they've been taught information that's 20 years old by professors who were taught 20-year-old information 20 years ago. So as soon as you publish your PhD, you're already stale dated. Right? You're already past your, your best by date. The only way you can stay relevant, which is something I don't see very often, are these... Uh, PhDs who continue to publish over and over again, like Charles Taylor, right? Sure, you don't have to publish these vapid articles every day, right? Or you don't have to be quite so prolific as, say, my uh, professor of uh, Shaivism, Vedanta, the, the Gita, uh, Stanislaw Timelstina. Um, you, you wouldn't believe how much publishing this guy does. It almost seems like he publishes a, a, a very intense scholarly article a week. <laughs> you know, it's, it's incredible. Or you could be like Charles Taylor, who actually spent many years on something that he was passionate about, right? Passio, something that consumed you. I mean, look at his exploration of a secular life. It's a wonderful book I, I wish more people would read. Because it opens our mind to this truth that no matter how good you are, no matter how much education you have, no matter how much you think you understand anything, you need to keep an open mind, right? I said this, the hardest thing for the human being to do, some of the hardest things, is to keep two conflicting ideas in your head at once, but also to keep an open mind, particularly about your own um, what would you call it? Your own biases, your own, uh, hmm, how would I put that? Well, you just got to admit that none of us are perfect. We have our own bias. We're very perspectival. But when it comes to predictions, this is why we're terrible at forecasting things. It's because you have to keep it an open mind. 
the greatest forecasters are those that even doubt their own opinions. And there's the true lesson of Dunning-Kruger. The only uh, scholars that I listen to, and I think this is what served me so well, that I understand Jung, I understand Nietzsche, I understand so many different philosophers, Charles Taylor, for example. Um, I've only started studying them in the last, what, couple months. But I went on, um, I just wanted to, to look up what his PhD thesis was, and I ended up reading the Encyclopedia Britannica entry uh, pretty good kind of failed on on some of the follow-up articles because they didn't give enough um, uh, sources to, right? Like they mention a couple authors and they don't tell you what author, they just give the last name. That's not adequate. Um, but it's a really good article because it explains, it really does a good job of explaining what uh, Charles Taylor believed. And he didn't say, this is true because I'm an expert. No, he said, based on these authors, this is what I believe to be, right? And he, he uh, made his case. He supports it with, uh, with data. Um, but he doesn't go around screaming at others who have a different idea, right? And certainly not going to go around screaming at some people who uh, are just beginning to understand, right? I've talked about this. When I first went to college, I, I went under some sort of a affirmative action, right? They told me they were going to give me a laptop and, and a voice to text so I could, um, I could compensate for my dyslexia, right? And no problem. You can't use computers. Well, we'll give you a computer. Okay, whatever. That had never ended up happening. I never got really any help whatsoever, but I still did all right. But what I, I realized is, again, like in healing, the only way forward in education is to become your own agent, right? And one of the first things, here I'm sitting in the cafeteria in the first week or so that I was at the college. I didn't really know very many people. Uh, again, as I said, um, I was like an affirmative action type, uh, what they brought me in. I was a couple years behind because at first when they, they diagnosed me with uh, severe dyslexia, they had no idea because of my memory and my compensation, my language, um, they said I really was hurt by being bilingual and, and having gone to school in both languages. I think they're wrong, wrong, wrong. I think why I made it to grade 10 or 11 before they even knew I had severe dyslexia was because of the, the development of the language center of my brain, right? Um, but they tried to convince me to go into trades because, oh, you got this disability. What are you going to do? And I'm like, no, no, I'm educating myself at that point. I had uh, begun uh, to teach myself uh, outside of school. And I said, no, th this is ridiculous. And so I actually used uh, an incident with a teacher who um, just hated the, the football coach and assumed I was a dumb jock because I was in, and I had to take this, believe it or not, even though I had gone from kindergarten to grade 10 in French, those French credits didn't count towards a post-secondary education. So they took me out of the French immersion program because they thought, oh, no, you're not going to be able to do it, and literally made me get new credits because of it. Right? So I had to take a grade 10 core French. And so this teacher assumed I just wasn't interested in learning when in reality, I didn't want to embarrass her because this teacher was actually, again, here's a great example. She was actually trained in Spanish, not French. But there wasn't a lot of call for Spanish in Canada. So this lady was teaching French in a French immersion high school. But mostly she was te teaching French to these English kids because uh, French immersion is not the entire school. Full French would have been the entire school, right? Because a bilingualism is what I wanted. I wanted to be able to speak both languages uh, fluently, not one and pretend to speak another as so many do in Canada. Really, it is less than 1% of people in Canada who are truly fluently bilingual, right? So this teacher tried to get me suspended because of my marks. And so it actually, nobody, of course, paid attention to how I was being treated in this French immersion class until she tried to have me suspended. She really wanted me to kick off the football team. But when she did that, she ended up having to go to the vice, pres vice principal. And that's when she was told, um, you do know that this kid probably speaks better French than you. And she had no idea because, as I told you, even in French immersion, I didn't speak French um, because even my fellow – and it's not being silly. It was because I grew up in a French community 
and I have this aptitude. I think there's a long story here, but I think uh, something that happened when I was young, I was struck in the head and I had a near death experience struck in the head by a, a softball. And I think that's what some of the doctors thought that uh, may have led to the learning disability, but I think it's more complicated than that. But I think that's what led to me leaning on the language center of the brain to compensate for areas maybe that weren't as fit as efficient. So unlike some of these other kids, uh, I grew up speaking French fluently, uh, English, French, and Gaelic actually in, in the household. Um, and so English and French really were, well, I thought in French when I spoke French and I thought in English when I, when I spoke English. Um, so I just didn't want to show up my, my friends in school. Plus, you know, I just didn't like being, you know, but it, 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 it takes a teacher to pay attention to things like this. It wasn't until I had a teacher who it, it happened one time. So by, it was grade 10 when, when my teachers realized that I was actually uh, high functioning, not, um, not a, a problem. Because what happened was there was a teacher who was the opposite of that Spanish teacher I told you. She um, spoke very little English, actually. So that's why she wanted us to speak, you know, French exclusively in her classes. Um, but then I told you, I think I've told you about this incident before, right? So again, the teacher, she thinks, you know, everyone's got to speak French. But she never really thought about this, right? Because these super nerdy rich kids in the class, right? They thought they were great with their French, but their accent was just, oh, oh, it just, it was horrible to listen to these kids speak French. But it wasn't until um, advanced, uh, it was actually a French literature. And weird, eh? in grade 10, make us take that because we had to get all this French out because in grade 11, we went back to uh, mostly English so that we could get rid of our French accents, right? Well, mm, that was me. Um, when I spoke English, uh, sometimes I had a French uh, way of saying things, right? So this is why I started speaking English almost exclusively, because welcome to Canada. If you speak English with an accent, even if you're fluently bilingual, you're still going to be treated like garbage by a certain segment of the population. Same can be said when we went to Quebec on school trips, um, right? Everybody in my class would be treated like crap because nobody in my class could speak French well, actually, I'm, I'm sorry that there were um, a couple times there were some kids that were transferred from full French for the same reason that I mentioned. The, the parents realized these kids uh, needed to speak English uh, much more so than French. And I'm not being rude. I'm just saying it's a fact here in Canada that uh, bilingualism is not what the, they say it is. Uh, but going to Quebec... It was actually quite weird because I have the opposite experience here in Ontario. So when we were in Quebec, la belle province, um, and again, my accent was a lot better when I was young, right? That's 30 years ago. But I would do the talking when we went around, um, the speaking, whatever. Uh, it wasn't just the words. Like the, the kids that I went to school with probably had the same vocabulary as I did. But the difference was, j'avais la... la um, I couldn't even say it. I'm thinking in English here, but I had an accent that sounded, sure, it didn't sound uh, Quebecois, but that's what they found somewhat intimidating because growing up, I was told by people who weren't in the French immersion, particularly the people out of Quebec, um, that my accent sound, uh, had, it sounded more European. Right. In fact, if you're wondering what I looked like when I was young and what I kind of sounded like, I got uh, Jacques Villeneuve a lot because of, you know, I could speak English and French uh, with a beautiful accent. Right? And so here's I'm in this uh, grade 10 literature class and the teacher was getting mad at me because uh, she remembered from the previous year I refused to speak uh, French. But now that we're in literature, here she's able to tell whether you're paying attention. So we're reading this book and I remember this, this is, you know, really changed everything. And, and I'm pretty sure she probably changed the minds of some of these other teachers, but we're reading this book, French. And, you know, the really good students in class were, you know, interacting and discussing. But as I've told you before, this is what I find funny. 
um, I've taken classes with master's level and PhD students, and they couldn't understand basic poetry, right? Illusions. And talked about this. Literacy is one thing. Fluency is another. Right? So the reason why I could get by here in this class was because we did the reading in class. So she'd do some reading because she knew the kids probably weren't reading at home. We'd read it in class. We'd take turns reading. Right? She wouldn't call on me to do the reading because I really hated it. Right? And it's because I was dyslexic. Right? My French was fabulous, but I couldn't read to save my life. I sounded like I was, you know, an un uneducated boob. But then we were, God, about a third or something away, way through the book. And it was a pretty cool book. It was a uh, science fiction. Uh, it was about uh, these people who had gone into uh, Mont Royal, uh, the mountain on the island in Montreal, um, to get away from some sort of uh, war, a dystopian future. And so they were living in the mountain and they were told not to leave the mountain. And the story is really cool because it's young kids looking for adventure, well, teens looking for adventure. It was pretty cool. I liked it. I enjoyed it. And so these kids were struggling to understand, like they could understand the words. They were fluent. I mean, uh, literate. They could understand the words on the page, but they weren't fluent. So they couldn't understand what was being said. Right. And so one day, I guess she was kind of pissed uh, because the students were just having a hard time, you know, understanding this stuff. And so she was kind of being a jerk, I guess. And she's like, well, you tell me, like, you know, so she calls on me. And I proceeded to explain exactly what was going on in the people's minds and yada, yada. And so she was silent. She was just shot. And that's when everything changed because she said to the class, she said, well, there you go. Right? That's paying attention, right? Like he may not speak French in class, but he's obviously paying attention. And from then on out, she was my buddy. She'd speak to me in French and she was okay with me responding. She'd want me to speak French to her. And, you know, <laughs> but I was a stubborn little lad. And I think she came to understand how tough it was for me because of the fluency in my French. She probably understood that I had uh, a pretty strong um accent that I was trying to cover and, and again, kids, right? But that's Dunning-Kruger, right? If the teacher hadn't realized that not all students are the same, right? Some students excel in some areas, some students excel in other areas, right? right? Just because I was able to do this or that didn't mean I was able to do everything. That's, that's the true lesson of Dunning-Kruger, is, right, sometimes the teacher will be surpassed by the student, right? And there is an example. I was reading a book recently. It's a really famous scientist, and I can't remember exactly who, but it doesn't matter. Super famous scientist that we know today. He was being mentored by another guy who was super famous at the time, someone we don't even know about now because, you know, he was just, you know, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? He has done nothing for astrophysics and we're just going to forget about him in the future, right? But people who are in the background right now doing real science, those are the names we're going to know in the future. So what ended up happening is finally when he struck out on his own, when he came up with his own ideas, this student of a master, the master tried to take credit for his ideas because, well, I, I nurtured him. I mentored him. So where else would the ideas come from? Right? That's the Tony Kruger. Instead of this mentor realizing that it's possible his mentor might be greater than, than, than he, he just wouldn't accept this. Therefore, living in ignorance and the opposite of being the educated teacher. Right? I, I love to give the example of Babbage and Lovelace. Ada Lovelace, not often given the actual credit she deserves. I've heard recently someone saying, oh, well, uh, Turing is responsible for modern computing. Yeah, he pushed it pretty forward, but I wouldn't credit him. I would credit Ada Lovelace. And I've heard people talk about Babbage and how he invented his... No, if it wasn't for Ada Lovelace, and please look into this. This is a great example of Dunning-Kruger. At that time, it was, oh, a woman can't smart enough. But can I also point out Teresa of Avila, 
I hear people for a long time till I studied about these Carmelite uh, scholars, uh, um, doctors of the church, right? Meaning they said nothing that was against uh, doctrine. But what I love about it is they talked about things that are beautiful, things like doubt and feeling separated from your source and, and your purpose. But I so often hear people talk about St. John of the Cross and his uh, ascent of Mount Carmel. More often, it's the dark night of the soul. But they often leave out Teresa of Avila, who was actually St. John's mentor. All right, or Therese of Lisieux, the young lady from France. A more modern saint, but also a... Uh, um, I just brilliant in her um, explaining who and what we are. And, and it's really quite good. I really do recommend reading her biography. But even when they talk about her, somebody other than Teresa of Lisieux, they'll talk about you know, her inspiration of uh, Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, right? And there's a funny one too. It's actually, uh, it's, uh, what is it? Uh, Juan de la Cruz, or Juan de la Cruz. I don't know how do I pronounce it back then. But they forget to mention well, the Carmelite, the, especially the what is it, the Discalced, the, the the shoeless Carmelites, were started by Teresa of Avila. And I love to show that too. Um, right, the Protestant Reformation begun by Luther, who arguably just wanted to date his uh, nun girlfriend without guilt and that's a joke please don't get upset by that i'm just saying there's lots of motivation in this world but Teresa of avila a catholic a carmelite realized that you know what there is some reform needed here but she realized she can reform from within right there's dunning kruger again luther went around thinking that he had the uh uh what would you call it the uh he had the corner on the market of, of, uh, of the true faith, and he thought by fiat he could fix it. When in reality, uh, you know, fixing is more a practice. People need to uh, change a habit, uh, not break one, right? So uh, if arguably the problem was bad doctrine or bad habits, that had developed over the years, then we just need to uh, replace it with good habits. All right, and that's the lesson to Dunning-Kruger. We have all these elitists, we have these noobs who are in the middle, uh, right, thinking they know everything, but truly, truly, the greatest minds are those that doubt even their own ideas. I, I told you, I ran into this recently, um, where I'm using a couple of different AI programs to back up what I'm talking about. And and I said this to the wife this morning, I have no doubt that the reason why I've come to understand many of these philosophers, I used to say it's because I read the philosophers. I didn't read what other people said about them. But as I said, over the last couple of years, I've begun reading more than a couple of years, but I've begun reading other authors. And that's led me to find wonderful authors like Charles Taylor, uh, Hannah Arendt, um, I mean, even Carl Jung. I mean, I probably wouldn't have read Carl Jung if I didn't realize um, that he was building upon Nietzsche's philosophy. William, William James uh, led me to Charles Sanders Peirce. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. But it only happens if you keep that doubt in mind, that this is Teresa of Lisieux. She looked at these great people like Teresa of, of uh, Avila and, and St. John of the Cross. She's like, what can I do? I'm just this nothing person, this tiny little person. And that's where she came up with her idea of the little way. Right? Not saying that, hey, I know best, but saying, hey, here's my perspective. Let me share it and maybe it'll guide some. Right? I love that expression that uh, share your story because uh, it may be somebody's uh, survival guide someday, all right? And that, for me, is uh, the Carmelites, is uh, Nietzsche or William James. They're, they are my guide. 
because I kept an open mind and realized that I don't have all the answers, nor are all the answers found in one place. I talk a lot about Nietzsche, but only because he was so right. He influenced so much later, but also he was so flawed. Right? I love that. I love the fact that some of the greatest insights come from some of the most flawed but authentic individuals in our history. Right? So as a final, just remember, when someone makes a call to authority or talks about their education or immediately take what they say with a grain of salt, right? Remember to believe nothing of what you hear and half of what you read. Even then, you must be careful because now you can't rely on uh, internet search engines. Most of them have been gamed to the point where the valuable links are slowly becoming second and third page uh, results. Right? <clears throat> so have doubt. Doubt is the first step towards an open mind. And the first step towards an open mind is the path towards understanding, towards knowledge. And wisdom is knowing how much there is to know. And that you may not be the foremost expert forever or even for long. And that uh, even some actor with some loony ideas might have a grain of insight that science hasn't seen in 70 years. Right? It, to me, it's mind-boggling that someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson will, will pull out the Dunning-Kruger to criticize someone who he thinks isn't in his uh, his uh, what would you call it his class when in reality he was showing us what Dunning Kruger is meant to teach not just that noobs think they know everything but more so that our elitists are what are holding us back now we don't have enough open minded philosophers and theologians and scientists right because science is likely not enough i mean you don't have to take my opinion for it but it's just about every philosopher theologian and even scientist of any value to humanity we must admit that there's more to life than what we can prove or what we can experience because just look at some of the science that we know, we've discovered it by proxy. And it may be true, but we haven't witnessed it ourselves, right? The observer quandary, right? We've measured the results, but we haven't witnessed them for ourselves. And certainly we don't understand why an observer, right? Not an agent involved, just an observer can change the outcome. Right? Or placebo. Or consciousness. Right? I made this joke before, and I believe it to be true, that because I began studying, um, I guess you'd say, Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism, Yogacara, this idea, the true nature of self. Because I started studying this at a very young age, um, philosophers attribute this... Uh, I guess you would say a gestalt experience, uh, illness, near death. For me, I've talked about this. It was simply sitting down in the cafeteria in a mall and looking around, right? I was reading this uh, thought experiment, not at the time. I'd been you know, bouncing around in my head for a while, but it applies to so much. I think at the time, Robert, uh, Robert Thurman's translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Varothodur, or the, the book of natural liberation in the between states. Uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is his most well-known. He published it, I think it was, what, in the 90s? And so that was what I was currently reading. But I just looked up, and I, and I started thinking about that thought experiment, this idea of 
are we uh are we uh sea monkeys in an alien's uh fishbowl or is everyone in this cafeteria simply actors on a stage for my benefit right if i and this is what i did i followed this thought experiment through and i thought so if I leave this cafeteria, these people don't exist anymore. Like they don't actually get in their car and go home and have relationships with their family and their kids. And then their kids have friends. And like for me to accept myself as the center of the universe or or the world to be some sort of contrived uh, Maya or illusion made no sense to me. And so that's why I fell in love with, with, kind of a, an in-between state, a madhyamaka, a, a middle way, that no, the world isn't what we perceive it to be. Because we're so biased, the world is, what would you say? Um, we don't perceive the world as it truly is. And we're incapable of that in no small part because it's our senses that experience the world and we're only told from our senses what they experience, right? So it's it's the telephone game. But neither here nor there. If you come to realize that the way forward, the way around Dunning-Kruger is the Chattiscoti or the Tetralemma in Greek, that the answer may be A, it may be B, it may be A and B, a combination in some way, or, most importantly, we may not be asking the right questions, or we may not be capable of understanding the answers. And until we approach the world, not with a sense of, of uh, dis, distrust, or, but with a sense of openness, often called doubt, but I don't see it that way. I see openness as a sort of trust, right? That's how we move forward. Carl Friston, the physicist, talks about this, this idea that deciding on our path allows us to focus in on a smaller portion of the chaos that is the future, right? The reason why the past seems so much more clear and less chaotic is because we've chartered a path through. And as I've said before, we haven't been distracted by needless fluctuations, right? Uh, the the vritti of life or the prat, uh, prakriti in Sanskrit, the idea of, you know, the stuff that goes on. <clears throat> if we can remain pure in our vigilance and our focus, that allows us to transcend bias. It allows us to transcend, say, uh, you know, people trying to convince us. Uh, it could even allow us to transcend Nietzsche's uh, re santima, this idea that we're non-player characters by the time we become adults because we have been traumatized by life so much that we no longer interact with reality. We're reactionary beings. When something happens in the present, uh, we react based on a template from uh, historical reactions, right? That's what trauma is. Trauma itself, by the way, comes from the German Tom for dream. Trauma itself is just re-experiencing a previous emotion in the present as if it were happening now. And a traumatic response is responding to a situation as if it were the same situation of the past. So no lessons being learned, right? Dunning-Kruger. But also foregoing your agency, right? So watch these elitists denature themselves and humanity because who is it? Uh, Charles Taylor agrees that if you don't affirm uh, who an individual truly is, not their fantasy, but who they truly are, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about this as well. He called it the double consciousness. When people treat you as something that you're not, it causes you to have a split. And that's being caused by these elitists who are suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect because they're up 
in their glass castle, their high castle, whatever you want to call it. And they're looking down on all of the plebs who uh, may not have the opportunity to the uh, millions of dollars in education that they had, right? Particularly some of these uh, affirmed uh, individuals. Yet they don't keep the proper sense of, of, well, what can I say? It just boggles my mind when I hear people talk about the, there's there's mainly two people that talk about Dunning Kruger. Uh, they're just trying to uh, minimize those who uh, don't have the same level of education they are they have right. They don't care if you spent more time studying this than they ever will. Or it's you know people that want to say that Dunning Kruger was disproved and it doesn't make sense anymore. But as I've said, tell me you haven't learned about this subject without telling me. Because I have yet to come across anything of any true value that discusses the Dunning Kruger effect and its and its uh, Im- impact on us and people and or whatever it can teach us. <clears throat> I've yet to come across. Uh, you know, someone who's a, a valuable thinker. I've yet to come across a, a paper or, or something that, that doesn't point out whether their experiment was a failure or not. The, the true lesson of Dunning-Kruger is not to be ignored, right? That yes, when people first start to begin to understand a subject, they start to think they're, you know, experts. I've run across this before uh, in Discord. There is a um, I guess he's impressed people with his understanding of philosophy before, but he goes around calling himself, uh, you know, by some edgelord name. And then, so they proceed to say, oh, what, you think he doesn't know about that philosopher? I mean, look at his name. And so I had to explain to him that, no, that name shows that I don't think he actually does understand the philosopher because the philosopher is talking about a balance, not extreme positions. The extreme positions were were used to show how dangerous that is. That we need to have a sense of doubt in everything, right? Moderation in everything, uh, including moderation. Well, that means moderation in your elitist uh, BS, moderation in 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 censoring moderation in everything, especially, I guess, even compassion, right? Because look what's happened to the world. I talked about this a few years ago. The only thing that I really uh, would uh, thank uh, Pema Chodron for, um, I think overall she's really harmed because literally when when that whole stuff came down, when she was defending um, horrible, uh, what do you call it? Horrible abuse in the, the Buddhist community she was in, she was defending the abusers. Then she came out and said, oh no, that's terrible. The abuse is terrible. But then she went right back, right back to the same uh, organization. So I believe if you look when all that was happening and see how uh, you know Buddhism has begun to crash in the West, I mean, it never was very good, but I was hoping that they would grow and start to learn where they've misunderstood a lot of this teaching and and the fact that there isn't sufficiency in Buddhism. And worst of all, they don't seem to understand that there is a soul in Buddhism. Uh, They just don't teach it here in the West. I thought maybe people might learn by now, but no, uh, it's what Pema warned us of, uh, that you need to, well, where I got it from is what I'm saying. It wasn't her thing. I'm sure she got it from someone else. But you need to limit your compassion. And if you don't limit your compassion, then you can see all these other horrible people as less than human. Like Martin Buber's I and Thou. So, what do you say at this point? Right, It's beyond the pale that people consider these individuals as experts, but they regularly share 
half truths or or just untruths. I mean, as I said with my own doctor, it wasn't until just now that um well, that's pedantic. I won't get into that, but the fact that when a doctor graduates, they haven't been taught nutrition or how to read studies. That explains for me why only 9% of Western doctors keep up to date on the new science. But I don't think a doctor should be allowed to, uh, to practice unless they stay up to date. But how do we get there? Because I told you, I know a doctor in Italy, a research scientist actually, in Italy, uh, but he's a doctor, you know what I mean, um, who argued with me. And when I say argued, which is just uh, took uh, umbrage with what I said about uh, only 9% of doctors. I said, well, I don't know about Italy. I said, this figure is, uh, is Canada, obviously, but I said, um, or North America. But I said, I can't imagine it's going to be much different. And so he proceeded to look it up. And well, the reason why he said that it's not the same here is because he said, uh, that it's law in Italy, that doctors have to stay up to date. He said, that's awesome. I wish they could do that. But then he was like, "Uh oh, nope. Only 40 some percent of Italian doctors are staying up to date with the current science. And that's with them risking their license and fines and all this other stuff for not staying up to date. And yet less than half of them are still staying up to date. Right. I mean, it's not different in other fields. I mean, uh, look at psychiatry, uh, that book that I read recently. Um, you know, she was just pointing out some of the issues with the, uh, the DSM manual that psychiatrists use. I've talked about this before. I believe it's less than half of psychiatrists rely on the DSM now for diagnostic uh, and statistical. Uh, <laughs> They don't diagnose based on that anymore because they found it uh, limiting or even uh, problematic. But plain and simple, when you find out, well, why is the DSM so heavily weighted when it comes to medication and, and it, it almost, um, what's the term they use? Uh, I don't know. It is problematic, right? This idea of disease. When... Uh, you know, in the DSM-5, uh, particularly, a lot of the symptoms are just regular symptoms. So it's really up up to the, uh, the, the shrink to decide at what point does, uh, you know, having trouble sleeping and, and uh, being uh, obsessed uh, about something, at what point does it become, uh, you know, an actual neurosis, as he says. And, I, and that's why I lean on Jung, because Jung said the vast majority of these neuroses are just something in the subconscious that hasn't worked itself out yet, right? It's a much better way to see it than, oh my God, you're broken, right? Uh, and the heavy weight on drugs. I think I've told you about this uh, firsthand anecdotal experience. Uh, I was actually uh, put through all of that experiments, right? They didn't understand that I had an inflammatory disease, not anxiety or depression. So I go back to when they, when they, when they first developed Paxil, the antidepressant, um, they hired a firm not to advertise Paxil, but they hired a firm to advertise generalized anxiety disorder. So was it any wonder that the number of people being diagnosed with that condition started to explode? But, well, Butrin was another one I went on for a while, and it was nice. Why? This is essentially an amphetamine. And I had a friend whose doctor put him on this, and not only did she put him on Wellbutrin without explaining that it was an amphetamine and that it was just to help him take the edge off so that he could start doing other things to help himself, she also put him on the max dose. And I warned him. I said, wow, this is not going to last forever. Um, so you got to use this time while you're feeling you know, human um, to change your habits. I right? use the motivation of not feeling so terrible. Uh, to eat better and exercise and get out and interact with people. Right? But no, doctor said none of this to him. Literally told him that the drug would fix it. 
that's what what do you do all right what do you do it's what i keep saying it's agency it's agency right you need to have agency in your healing in your religion in your philosophy in your path right because nobody can give you that healing nobody can make you whole without you but the hard part is, is you can't do it alone, right? You need society, you need people. So, I mean, we are the most complicated animal. We really are. We really are. But the beauty of that is, is that's why, that's why we are a gestalt being, a meta-modern being. Gestalt sounds stupid, I'm sorry, but it, it says something we can't say in English. Gestalt means we're greater than the sum of our parts. But we're not any one of those little parts. Who and what we are is the complex of those parts. And in the interaction, we produce wonderful things. We have a potentiality. As Jung said, modern man stands at the edge of a void. And what he meant by that is closer to the shunya, shunyanta, the idea of potential. Right? Rather than being held back by traditions, which are peer pressure from dead people, um, you're looking for truth wherever it may be, wherever it may be. But on that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Oh boy, I thought this would be a short one. But yeah, I was really upset, uh, particularly that Neil deGrasse Tyson attacked somebody else based on the Dunning-Kruger when he is the greatest example of the failure of scholarship in the modern age or Eric Weinstein not calling him on it or just, you know, being pedantic about terms, uh, term wars is what I call. I run into this in Buddhism all the time. Rather than seeing the universality of language or looking for what we share, so many people are actually trying to, I don't know, it seems there is far more people trying to obscure our paths than there are trying to, you know, expose them or open them up. As a result, most of these paths are very narrow indeed, as Jesus said, right? Very, very narrow indeed, right? He said the, the gate to heaven is narrow for a rich man. And what are we, all of us, but some of the most incredibly rich individuals on this planet, right? How blessed we are that we have running water and electricity. How blessed we are that we have uh, modern science, medicine. But at the same time, how blessed are we that we have all of these authors from thousands of years old, that have relevant insights to share to us to this very day. As I said before, uh, this whole journey of self really came to fruition when I was reading Vasubandhu. Vasubandhu is uh, an early uh, sage of the Yogacara school. And uh, when he explains the nature of self, he says, the self is upakara. Upakara is a Sanskrit word that means something that's close about, something close at hand. But the way I explain it is, and it relates to the snake and the stick, but the way I relate it is if you're walking down the street and you step in some dog poo, if you pick up a stick, stick to scrape off uh, the dog poop, well, you're not going to continue to carry that stick for the remainder of your life and label it your, your, your poop clearing stick. You're going to cast it aside and move along, right? This is the Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhi, swaha, right? So the paragate means away, but parasamgate means perfectly aware, away. So you can achieve a certain amount of um, uh, separation from the sufferings of life so that you can maintain your level of awareness of enlightenment, whatever stage you're at. One of the hardest things to do, the Dunning-Kruger, knowing that you may be an enlightened being, but you're as much at risk of losing that enlightenment as the most unenlightened individual. 
we're all together in this. 